cigars all around Cheers, y'all Well, 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 well That was a specially good one today Thank you, sir Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this fine program Known internationally as Smoking and Toasting. Yes, this is the world famous. Hi, Mom. Smoking and Toasting. Uh, the program's all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars. And we are at show number 192, Ian. So that's. Uh, we are. I, we might actually be a little more than halfway to 200. I think at we this might. Point. We're getting close. We're getting close. Uh, so uh, we're brought to you by B&B Butchers and Restaurant at 1814 Washington Ave in Houston and in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth, BB Italia on Memorial in Houston and BB Lemon, Washington Ave, as well as the Annie Cafe and Bar on Post Oak Boulevard in mm. Houston. Uh, welcome to the program. Today we're going to talk about what's so special about single barrel bourbon, and I'm sure you have some thoughts on that, Ian. So, uh, so it'll be fun to uh, it'll be fun to talk about. But I have thoughts. I've got an article that kind of breaks down why single barrel bourbon has become such a you know such a big deal in. The world of spirits right now, and it certainly has. I mean, uh, in fact, um, we're going to be tasting. Maybe Adam, take a shot of Mister Torley gig there. We're going to be tasting this single barrel uh, bourbon, which is a spec single barrel selection from Rio Brazos, Texas Bourbon and College Station. Specs, of course, here in Houston is uh, and throughout Texas is one of the big you know uh, places to go and buy wine mm -hmm. and spirits and beers and stuff. And so this was a, a barrel they hand selected. And when I was shopping. And, and buying this this week, I uh, I was just eavesdropping on people's conversation in the aisle there mm -hmm. where all the bourbons and, and whiskeys were. And two different people were asking the guys from Specs who help you out, well, is this single bur single barrel? Do they have a single barrel? Like, And I was like, it really struck me how big a deal single barrel has become. In I, the have, bourbon I have both uh, thoughts and opinions that don't always intersect with each other. But um, that's that's one of the things I like about you. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I wonder how many people actually know what single barrel means. Well, we'll get into that uh, today. I've got a great article. We'll uh, take a little bit of uh, information from, and then and then you can uh, you know you can break it down from your perspective, and then we'll be doing a tasting of this uh, single barrel uh, bourbon. We've done a number of those before, but we'll do this particular one. And as you, I don't know if you can see on Mister Torley gig, Ian, but. This one I haven't broken into you yet. You have not. There's actually uh, yeah. liquid in the neck of the bottle. You can't I, see it on here. I'll, it was, I'll pull it down. So it was a little difficult to I'll, actually. I'll just put it right up in there, my camera. Yeah, you there actually you have not. Yeah, it's still got the wax on on the top of it. So it was a little difficult to restrain myself, but I thought, you know, that, that wax cap there is so interesting looking. Right now it's wax on, it, soon to be wax off. Wax off, off exactly. I just miyagi the which bottle. Is, which is a good thing. Yeah, <laughs> which is a good thing. Uh, so looking forward to this. We're also going to taste, I think, think some very interesting beers today uh, from one of my absolute favorite breweries, Parish Brewing Company in Broussard, Louisiana. Uh, uh, we're gonna be, so good. We're going to be tasting their original Pilsner beer. Now, they have what is you know basically tied for me with my favorite IPA in the world, and they make a number of different very interesting hazies and juicies. They do the Ghost in the Machine, yeah. which is just phenomenal. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant beer. Uh, so let's uh, let's see what happens when they try their hand at a Pilsner. This is, you know, Pilsners, we've talked about this. Pilsners are tough. They're more difficult to brew, and I think more Pilsners taste like other Pilsners than a lot of styles in in the beer world, you know what I mean? There's a lot of times when you try a pilsner and you go, yeah, that tastes just like a a, 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 a different pilsner. So I think um, I think pilsner just due to its, the delicacy of the flavor overall mm -hmm. is a little more difficult to balance. So I think that's that's a large part of. It. Plus, it's more uh, it's more labor intensive to brew than absolutely. For instance, well, porter. The, these guys at at Parish Brewing know their stuff, so it'll be really interesting, I think, to see how they how they handled the pilsner. That'll be awesome. I'm pretty excited about that. Um, also, you may recall last week in our drinking news story, I, I opened the story with the line, a man from China. A oh, man from and, China. And you immediately started laughing and, and called into mind the fact that if a story starts with a man from China or 
a Florida, Florida man. man. There's you, a whole website dedicated to Florida, yeah, a Florida you, man. You know that it's going to be a thing, <laughs> right? Uh, so today we'll be tasting, and I talked about this last week, and I brought it, and it's nice and cold. Uh, Cigar City Brewing from Tampa, yeah. who make great beers. Yeah. Oh, their brown ale. Oh, oh the, the Maduro. The, the Maduro oh. brown ale is one of my absolute favorites from them, and it's one wonderful. of my favorite beers. Yeah, wonderful. Uh, so they have a double IPA that's called Florida Man. Nice. And I was on their website this week. They even have Florida Man T-shirts, which looked really interesting. <laughs> and I think even though I don't live in Florida, I may have to get a T-shirt to get a that Florida proclaims me to be right. a Florida man. Uh, and then finally, very excited about this, St. Arnold's Bishop's Barrel number 25 is out. I'm not sure how long it's been out, but I think it's I think it's very recent. Uh, and uh, I, I don't was, think I have the 25. I don't think so. I called you during the week. I said, have we done the 25 no, on the show? I think I, think I, I think, have up to 24 in my fridge. I think maybe the last one we did was either 22 or 23. And they release these periodically a couple times a I wanna, year. I want to also point out that uh, one of these shows coming up, and I always forget to get with you about this, but uh, we're going to have to start going through my uh, beer collection because some of it's been in there for quite a few years. Okay, well, let's... And uh, we don't want it all to go bad. Yeah, and and nor do we want to do a show where it's all chunky beers. So yes, uh, so no. we need to start, you know... I don't understand what that means. Putting a few of them into the rotation. I mean, I, I mean, I understand what you mean by chunky beer. I just don't understand what you mean by we don't want chunky beer. <laughs> I didn't say we don't want chunky beer. I said we don't want to do a show that's all <laughs> chunky beers. So, uh, you know, we, we really should do a chunky beer blind taste test. I think that would be a lot of fun. Which one is the chewiest of all the chunky there beers? There you go. So a uh, little shout out. Miss Jessica from uh, uh, Barrel Bourbon is on. Oh, nice, watching Jessica. Us. That's pretty awesome. I got some old uh, high school friends watching, some CCSD buddies as well. Jessica, you were such an awesome guest. She we was would, fantastic. We would love to have you back on the show, so I'll have uh, Ms. Mary contact you about uh, about scheduling you back in. I'm sure the beautiful thing about Barrel Bourbon yeah. is that every iteration they put out is different from the last. Right. So it keeps evolving. Right. So I'm and, assuming every time she comes on the show, and I it's took home, new she was different. kind enough to leave some things behind last time, mm -hmm. and I took home their rum, yeah, which is I outstanding. That. Well, it's I, I had the number twenty, and um, and I'm coveting it at my house. Like it's yeah. one of those. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> it's only, next to the cigar malt. It's only, like uh, uh, just okay, very kind of special occasions. That's high stuff. praise. Right, that's right. high <laughs> praise. Uh, a roof collapsed at the Partagas factory in Cuba. We'll oh. give you that story. Not a good thing. Um, we'll also talk about um, how COVID is continuing to impact uh, cigar companies and beer companies. Um, and we will also take a look at the Rob Report. They've named their nine best cigars of 2020. Now, the Rob Report is one of those magazines that probably about – it's designed for people – it's basically for rich people. Yep. It's a magazine for people who have a lot of money who might be interested in, you know, buying a private plane or things like things like that, right? I actually subscribed to it for uh, a year uh, a while back, and and it convinced me that the Rob Report's readership is made up of about one percent people who have a lot of money and are interested in buying private planes and things, and ninety nine percent people who don't have a lot of money but who like leaving it out on their coffee table it's, to impress their friends. It, it's not for rich people. It's for the discerning consumer. There you go. It's for people who wish they were rich <laughs> yeah. is what I'm getting at. Uh, but So anyway, the Rob Report can often be like ridiculous in their mm -hmm. uh, in their recommendations and what they think is great. But, but that being said, all, that's what they're about. But it's always interesting. Right. So we'll take a look at what they say. Think of it as... These guys are saying if money is no object, here are the nine best cigars of 2020. So we'll uh, we'll get into that as well. So there's a lot going on today. It's been a uh, a week here in Houston where we've gone a couple of steps backwards in terms of you know the reopening process after um, you know the COVID uh, pandemic was you know it hit and everybody sheltered in place and then things slowly started to reopen, but maybe not slowly enough. And things have had to take a, a few steps back, and that's happening a lot of places around the country. Here, bars are closed again. Yeah. So that's kind of a uh, – I mean, it's good in the sense of helping to stop the spread of disease, but, boy, I miss being able to go out and have drinks with yep. friends somewhere. Yeah, it, uh, it's, agreed. It's not quite the same to just invite people over. Plus, I'm kind of scared to invite a bunch of people over. Well, you know? so uh, I've, uh, I've been social on Zoom. Mm-hmm. And Skype, mm -hmm. that's been, I've had some evenings where I just Skype buddies and stuff like that. Um, uh, mm -hmm. I have um, 
one friend that lives around the corner, and uh, they had a scare uh, right about two weeks ago that someone he works with yeah. and had hung out with them and, and he went to lunch with had, uh, had tested positive. So him and his wife both immediately went and tested, but yeah. they got the clear. They were uh, clear that's, on it. And it's been good. two weeks since then. So good. they've been back. And, and and clear for two weeks, and I've been back for two weeks and stuff like that. So we're actually going to hang out and have a drink tonight, <laughs> right? A celebratory drink. Yeah, we're not is, we're not going to be kissing and hugging, but yeah, you know, yeah. <laughs> like, well, you know, it can be harder actually to socially distance at your home. Like at least when, because my wife and I went out one time when the bars reopened. We went to yeah. Axelrad here in Houston, and they have a big outdoor area, and they had people spaced out, and you know, people were wearing masks except except when they were eating and drinking, mm -hmm. and it seemed relatively. Say, I mean, it seemed like maybe a more acceptable risk. I guess would be a good way to yeah, put it. You, yeah, you didn't feel like you were just taking your life into your own hands. You still felt like you were taking precautions. But at home, I mean, our houses, unless you have a much bigger place than mine, yeah, his aren't his that big. place. Yes, he, he has a nice big uh, back patio area with a table around it. So when you sit, you're not all right next to everybody. It's, yeah. it's pretty nice, and yeah. he's got a whole backyard area with a fire pit, and which all is that. nice. Yeah, yeah. So he's he's got it set up, and he's very conscious about it. So that's why he's like one of the few friends that, <laughs> that you feel I'm like it's okay going to hang out yeah. with a right. lot of because I mean it's it's a scary thing, you know. It right is. now it's. It really it's is. the new normal, unfortunately. The friends that you almost feel the safest hanging out with are the ones that don't hang out. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because yeah. they're less now, likely Now to I'm have... in contact with my hermity friends. Yeah, right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and by the way, you, you mentioned Zoom. Don't you know the guys at Zoom are just slapping themselves on the head right now going, why didn't we just make it a dollar? Yeah. Why did we make it free? Yeah. Why didn't we just make it one dollar? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I'd have paid a dollar for Zoom. I would have. Sure. Yeah. You know? I would. I mean, apps like that. Like, if it was a, a five dollar app, I would have bought it. Right. It's nice that it's free though, and I'm sure they're picking up uh, advertising money and they're picking up uh, uh, for larger groups and stuff right. like that. And, and there is a premium there's a time package, limit yeah. and stuff. Sure. But, you know, but what a great what a great app it is. You know. Wish, well, I wish I invented it. Amidst the lack of uh, socializing and the time on Zoom, have you had an opportunity to smoke anything interesting this week? Uh, I have. I have actually. Let me pull that up right now and tell you all about it. I, I have no idea what you uh, what you're going to talk about today. I am going to talk about an Alec Brad Alec Bradley Project Forty. Project Forty. Have you had this? I have not. I've never seen it before. I I don't think I've heard of it. You know, I I picked it up sight unseen. I just grabbed it because I was like, wow, I haven't seen this before, and I've seen most of the Alec Bradley sure. stuff, and and, and they're, Alec Bradley's pretty solid overall. Oh, yeah. So it's one of those brands that I just that that's a whole trust factor. Like I just pick it up and go. Whatever. Sure. I didn't even look at the price of it when I picked it up. It's like a Rocky or an AJ. Right. Or, or what, uh, you, you, you go, yeah, I'm sure this will be good. So I forgot to write it down. It's a Robusto, but I think it was uh, five, uh, 50 by 5.5, I think, okay. five and a half, something like that, uh, Robusto. It was a nice uh, little cigar. Uh, so I'm going to read. Uh, so it's a Nicaraguan uh, wrapper, Habano, Brazil uh, binder, Brazilian binder, and uh all Nicaraguan filler in this, okay? But there's an interesting thing on the uh, website that he talks about on this, so I'm going to read the quote from the website. It says, Project 40 is a search to find a deeper understanding as to why cigars have a positive cognitive impact on the mind and body. Similar to music, cigars have a calming effect that allows us to feel in control as well as feel rewarded. A proper blend, price, and experience has been developed for your enjoyment. Take control of your happiness, end quote. I love that. Yeah, it was really good, and there's there's a scientific background to it as well, but I'm not going to get into it. Uh, well, and nobody talks about that when they talk about the dangers of cigar smoking. And, I mean, and everything's yeah. dangerous. Yeah, you every, know? you're absolutely right. Guess what? Water's dangerous. Right. You should drink a lot of water, but it's dangerous too. Right. Um, air can be dangerous. Everything. Especially these days. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> everything is dangerous, and, and people want to point, well, you're doing this dangerous, you're doing this dangerous. Well, you know... Stay at home. Yeah. You right. know what? Staying at home, sitting on your butt, that's dangerous too. It absolutely Guess is. Guess what? Everything can be like that. But there's a lot of positive in everything too. And that's one of the things about like when we started this show, smoking a cigar is a great way to sit down, chill out, calm down, regroup your brain. It's mental wellness. It is. It absolutely is. You know, and if it's not, don't smoke cigars. Right. 
I mean, that's pretty simple, right? <laughs> exactly. There's a lot of people out there, well, I don't like cigars. Well, don't. Well, don't smoke them. Yeah, yeah. I don't smoke cigars. I don't like breaking my arm, so I try not to. You know? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> that's also not good yeah. for my health. I don't like beets, so I don't eat them. There you go. You know? That's pretty it's simple. Just, just I don't thing. get mad at other people for eating beets right. in if, my vicinity. If you like beets, go for right? it. Right? Like yeah. the people at the table next to me eating beets, I don't care. <laughs> so anyway, let's get, let's get beyond that rant. So the appearance of this was kind of rustic, um, a medium brown, maybe a reddish brown kind of thing going on, veiny, leathery kind of wrapper. It wasn't a real pretty cigar. It wasn't a bad looking cigar, just yeah. not a super pretty cigar. Right. Uh, it had two little labels on it. One said um, one had the uh, lot forty or for project forty, not lot forty. Uh, project forty, and the other one said uh, experimental series. On it. It's really nice uh, looking labels. I did like the labels. Um, the The whole cigar had a firm overall feel, but it was a little uneven and lumpy on the outside. So, again, this is a little bit of an ugly duckling, but not yeah, bad. I'm looking at your picture, and definitely it's it's not the most beautiful cigar. Yeah, ever. it's not a gorgeous wrapping, but it. Uh, but I wouldn't. I wouldn't refuse to date it. Right. The you know? pre <laughs> the, the pre light sniff on this. Uh, I got lots of sweet creaminess, uh, coffee, leather, tea leaf, hay, cedar, and a hint of chocolate right off the nose off this. Nice. And what's funny is it didn't have a real big, big, powerful smell, but it was a nice smell, you know, mm -hmm. overall. Uh, the pre-light draw, I used a clip on it, um, and uh, uh, I've moved to using a clip because I have a clip that magnetically attaches to my lighter. So I used to have a lighter that just right. I remember that has a punch built in. So I used to punch everything. Now I clip everything because you know, anyway. Yep. Good convenience, you know. Uh, so I used a clip on it. Um, the pre light draw uh, was uh, uh, close to effortless draw. Really nice, uh, really nice flavor coming from it was coffee, semi sweet chocolate, raisin. There was a very raisin like hmm. kind of. And I sat there and thought about that. I was like, raisin's not something I expect, but very dark fruit raisin kind of. Yep. Taste coming from this. Hey, uh, I put tea, uh, tea leaf, slight cooking spice. The initial light on this was chicory, coffee, and white pepper. Really? Yeah, you know chicory has a yeah, very, it's got a very distinct flavor, very distinct mm -hmm. flavor. And uh, I don't drink chicory coffee, but I've had it before. It's hugely popular in New Orleans. In New Orleans, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, and I've had it before, and it just like immediately was like, oh, that's what that is. White pepper, because because the, the pepper is very much on the outside, back of the cheeks and tongue, mm -hmm. kind of flavor there. Uh, tangy cedar notes, sweet creamy retro hail on that uh, initial light, and that's just the initial light. The first third of this, it had a slightly uneven burn. Like once I lit it, it almost was uneven. Like right at the beginning of it, I didn't tend it. I just left it. I said, you know what? We're gonna see where it goes. Uh, let's see, big silky smoke. Like I, I just kept blowing uh, smoke rings with it. I kept trying to take a picture of me blowing smoke rings, but it looked like me just making a funny face with a bunch of smoke <laughs> in front of me. But um, <laughs> I probably should have added a couple of those just to say that. This is, that is what it looks like when I try to blow smoke right? rings because I am not good big at it. Big silky all. smoke. Lots of coffee. Semi sweet chocolate. Creamy sweetness going on all the way through here. Hay, <clears throat> tangy pepper and cedar. I'd say it's a mild plus strength here uh, at this point of the cigar. That's a little uh, foreshadowing, by the way. Mm -hmm. Solid ash, slightly uneven burn all the way through the first third, but it never got bad enough for me to tend it. It was just a little bit off. Right. The second third of this, cedar and nutty flavors move forward, followed by the semi-sweet chocolate and coffee with raisin and white pepper like all over that, that 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 raisin and white pepper was everywhere in this, and it was a really really interesting flavor. I wasn't expecting it was really good, and I was just having water with this. I didn't have any coffee or anything sweet or anything, so I was I was feeling like my uh, my palate was at its peak right then and there. <laughs> uh, the burn evened out and then went slightly uneven again. Solid ash. Yeah. All right. So the last third of this, pepper and raisins ship shift right up front it's got this really sweet raisiny thing. i really enjoyed it like that sounds weird but i really enjoyed it um i understand the, the shift uh up front followed by creamy coffee and chocolate uh cedar and nutty kind of finish overall hints of hay in here as well definitely a medium plus by this point mm. so it had gone from a mild plus from to a, a mild plus. plus to a medium plus by the last third of the cigar so it built up a little bit but not in any kind of harsh way, just in a in a flavor and a little power kind of way. Um, the uh, the uh, by the end of it, by the last third of this, the burn evened out, 
and burned evenly all the way to the end of the wow, cigar. So you see in the last couple pictures, it yeah. burned. And I never tended it. I just watched it. Right. Uh, this cigar cost me $5.30. Wow. This might be one of my absolute new favorite, like, go-to lawnmower cigars. If I smoke a second one and it's this good, then I'm buying a box. There's there's no two ways about it. That means a box of these is right at $100. Not bad at all. And it smoked for an hour. That's Almost great. an hour, you know, That's just great. about. I gave it a six on the price to quality. I would have not blinked an eye if I had paid seven or eight dollars for this cigar. That's I didn't good. even look at it when I bought it. I had to actually look at the receipt and go, "How much did I pay for this?" So I was pretty blown away by it. Good job, Alec Bradley. Alec Bradley is solid. They really do yeah. a great job overall, and um, I, I love that they, you know, keep trying new blends and new things. And it's it's. Uh, you know, it's a pretty exciting thing about them. Yeah, I love seeing the uh, the new stuff. Well, it's really interesting some of the things you said uh, about your cigar, because let me tell you about what I smoked. I smoked the E.P. Carrillo Elite Selection Oscuro Pyramid Royale. Say that again. Oh, you, you would no. ask me to say <laughs> I'm that just again. Teasing you. <laughs> uh, and and as I as I wrote in my little, you know, I generally try to jot down while I'm doing the tasting. I try to jot down some notes, so I'm reading from my tasting notes or as I apparently misspelled my tasting noters. Oh, um, nice. Yeah. Uh, it's a very a very dark cigar, but... The like, Oscuros well, are very dark, yeah. Well, yeah, and usually when I think of an Oscuro, I think of a super dark, almost yeah. like, you know, black like these mic just coverings. About, yeah. uh, this one wasn't quite that dark. It was more like a just a little bit darker than a typical Maduro, uh-huh. but it was, uh, it was nice. Um, in 2016, Cigar Aficionado named this their number four cigar of the year, which I did not know when I bought it. Uh, but when I was, you know, looking up a few things about it uh, on the internet, that's that's what I found out. It's like, okay, well, it's got a good pedigree. Then it had a dark Mexican wrapper surround, uh, that was surrounding the Ecuadorian binder and Nicaraguan fillers. So uh, an interesting combination of of tobaccos in this. Pre-light on it was very earthy with a little bit of sweetness that I couldn't quite identify. And so I clipped the top of the torpedo off with my cigar scissors and uh, it lit up quite easily. Some nice Nicaraguan pepper hit right away Mm -hmm. from the filler tobacco, uh, but it settled down pretty quickly. There was chocolate and a sweet earthiness in the first third and it lit up. uh, I mean, it it, um, also, I should say, had some tangy pepper to it, which was mm-hmm. which was nice. By the time I hit the second third of the cigar, and this is so interesting because of what you said about your smoke, by the time I hit the second third, I identified that sweetness I was getting. It was a raisiny ha! kind of sweetness. <laughs> and, and I thought, I don't know if I've, you know, it's probably been months since I mentioned raisiny as a flavor for a cigar. It's funny we, that we come up with it in the same right. one. We get it sometimes in you know some of the darker beers and stuff, but not usually in in cigars, or at least at least for me, not that usually. So it was it was uh, very pleasant. Um, as I said, there was some chocolate uh, uh, in there with the raisiny vibe. Um, some leather notes kind of uh, picked up in the second third. Those intensified. The leather intensified. As it smoked, it was nice and complex, but it was a very different flavor from the typical Nicaraguans that I smoke, like the AJs and, and some of the others. Um, I liked it better and better the longer I smoked it, which was also really interesting. It's like at first I thought, yeah, this is OK. And by the time I hit the, you know, the middle of the cigar, I was like, this is really good. Yeah, and I was just the more I smoked it, the, the better it seemed to get. Uh, the last third was even better. And, and the strength on the last third, kind of ramped up from medium full where it had started uh-huh. to, like, completely full Straight body. up full, yeah. Yeah, straight up full body. Uh, construction was really good. It was a slightly crooked burn, which you can see in some of the pictures. Um, <clears throat> but like you, I didn't tend this one. And it had a super solid ash. I don't know where we are in the pictures right now, but there's one where you can see I've got a good inch, inch and a half going. And at that point, I went ahead and tipped it because I was actually— It's going to fall yeah, on Yeah, I was point, actually yeah. you know certain that it was going to wind up on my shirt. Um, anyway, the room note was also really uh, rich and pleasant. It struck me as that kind of cigar that when you're smoking it, people come up to you and they go, Oh, what are you smoking? That smells really good. Yeah. It was one of those kind of cigars. Uh, my favorite thing I think about the Selection Oscuro was this slight peppery tang that it left on the tongue in the middle of the palate. It was just a really pleasant uh, kind of experience. Um, it's a seven to eight dollar cigar. It was a nice change of pace for me. 
I'm going to give it a 5.5 5 at at seven to eight bucks. If this had been a six dollar cigar, I'd have been like, wow. Yeah. Um, at seven to eight, it gave me what I was hoping for, and even though it was different from the other seven and eight, that's kind of my sweet spot for cigars. Yeah, usually, yeah. is around seven and eight. So even though it was a little different from those. I, I liked it. I liked it a lot. I would highly recommend it. The E.P. Carrillo Elite Selection Oscuro Pyramid Royale. I said it again. Uh, um, EPC is just make, they well, make great cigars. They really do. And what uh, what was interesting for me about this was it was just such a change of pace from what I usually uh, smoke. And so just that difference in itself was uh, was real, really enjoyable. I liked it. Okay, coming up, uh, we're going to taste our first beer, the Paris Brewing Company's Original Pilsner Beer. Plus, we have drinking news on the way, and the PCA, which used to be IPCPR, uh-huh. the Cigar Association, they've uh, let, this last week they furloughed every single employee. Wow. It's, it's all, No one is working there right now. Wow. So that's, again, this is what's happening to industries uh, in, you know, cigars and, and spirits and, and beer as we work our way through this. So we'll tell you about that. Plus, July is Craft Beer Month. Yay! We need a July is Craft Beer Month song or or, or something. Okay. okay. I'm going to get to songwriting so here. You, you work on some songwriting <laughs> for us. It's Smoking and Toasting. We will be uh, right back with a little Parish Hand Brewing Company. Hand me that company. next beer so Pilsen. I can put it up here. I will do that right now. You see how I rhyme that? Welcome back. It is Smoking and Toasting. It's the program that's all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars. It's show number 192, and we're brought to you by B&B Butchers and Restaurant. Ian uh, was kind enough to bring up some uh, Shiner Bach for the show beers today. And I know that uh, show beers are the ones we're not actually doing tastings on them, but we sometimes have them just to get the palate going and, and because we're thirsty and because beer. beer. Uh, and, uh, I, you know, I know we've said this several times, but. This beer is so consistently good. Yes. It is just a wonderful... It's the kind of beer... I love having this in stock in my refrigerator because it's the kind of beer that no matter if you're a a, a total craft beer aficionado or if, you're, or if you generally drink you know, the mainstream macro brews, everybody can kind of agree gonna like it, on yeah. Shiner Buck. It's, it's the beer everyone agrees on, kind of like those it's soft a, rock it's stations. It's a gateway beer. It's, it's the station everyone can agree on at work. <laughs> so Shinerbach, I didn't, and I, that sounds like I'm putting down Shinerbach. I love Shinerbach, uh, and it's, and I'm enjoying it very, very cold right now. Thanks to um, Ian. Couple quick things that we got comments. Uh, Greg Doxakis, uh, Dox, as we know him from uh, Pierre Ferron, he said, "What's the call-in number? I have a question about smoked hops. How do you keep them lit?" I said, "Try a blunt wrap." Oh, that's good. That's good. Uh, uh, Bruce like Stark said, "Ian, you're talking about Zoom meetings earlier. Any chance you're going to do another?" Smoking and toasting Saturday Zoom meeting again. I think we ca- probably should put we, one together. Yeah, we haven't done one in a while. We were doing them like every other week for a yeah. while, and then I I just was wondering if everybody was you we know, got busy, kind of getting zoomed out. You know what well, I mean? Well, I think that we we quit when everything was just starting to kind of open up again right. too. So I think that maybe, maybe we should put another one together. Um, uh, I think probably next weekend. Okay, yeah. Let's not do this weekend because yeah, it's Fourth of July tight, and yeah. it's crazy. Uh, but uh, but yeah, let's plan that for next weekend. I will post. On the Smoking and Toasting yeah. Facebook page, I'll post the Zoom address so you can just click on it and, and join, and we'll uh, we'll do that. It'll be fun. Yep, uh, we'll I I really enjoyed those. Those were those were terrific. Cigar smokers in Virginia are going to find their favorite cigars costing a bit more this week. The well, s- that's not surprising. The state cigar fa- uh, cigar tax just doubled. Now that doesn't double the price of the cigar, but the tax doubled. Yeah. People, we are under attack from governments, local, state, and federal, if we enjoy premium cigars. Well, you know why they get away with that, right? Because everyone who doesn't smoke cigars is like, well, I don't care about cigars. Cigars are, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and that's a that's a health risk. Yeah, yeah, tax them. I mean, I don't smoke cigarettes, but the taxes on cigarettes are ungodly. Un- it's it's like, and I'm I'm not speaking with great knowledge here, but I think it's almost half of the it's, cost of a pack of cigarettes yeah, I mean, it's goes crazy. to taxes. It is. It it's nuts. Think about this for a second. Mm. 
Like the whole everyone was like smokers should quit smoking, smokers should if everyone did, how much taxes oh. how much tax revenue do you think everyone we, would lose? We'd lose a lot is what we do. Then they'd be raising taxes uh, oh on everything else. On, you have. on stuff you do use, people yeah. who are not smokers. So yeah. It's always you know but it's always the, the quote unquote sin tax. Yeah. You know, that's that's what they that's, that's what, how they justify it. Right. Because no politician wants to raise income taxes. Right. Because that that's a pretty quick way to get yourself unelected next time an election comes around, right? right. Everybody always goes in promising to cut taxes. Well, that's why they that's them. why they keep jacking up taxes on things you don't need, right? Yeah, you know, and I, any I just, luxury kind of item. So this is when we have to get Trey boring and go, Trey, what do we do? Cigar rights of America. At uh, least I'm wearing my CRA shirt least, right now. At least there's an organization <laughs> that is out there fighting for us, and that's a, uh, that's a really good thing. Um, so we'll get to drinking news in a couple of moments, but I thought we should really get to drinking, and not just the show beers. Ian, the Parish Brewing Company, original Pilsner beer. I think it's time to taste, don't you? Let's check it out. It's got a very classy label on it. Yeah, I was saying uh, during the break, it kind of looks like a flag to me. It's got that you well, know, it's just got the, the structure Texas to it. Yeah, flag kind of thing almost going mm-hmm. on. Yeah, it really, really Weird. is. And I of course, don't know what was the. Uh, I don't know what the Louisiana flag Louisiana looks like. like, but it's blue and red and white with a single star. So mm-hmm. I don't know, but it's got the little uh, uh, parish. Uh, uh, symbol on it with the Florida Lee and everything. It says original Pilsner. Oh, I get what they're going for. What does this look like? Well, I, I looks said like Lone Star can, doesn't oh, it? Oh, it kind of does. I bet. I it? bet that's what they're kind of going for. I bet it doesn't taste like Lone Star. I bet you know. Let's. Well, Lone Star is a passable let's find beer. Out. Yeah. Oh man, that may be oh, one of the yeah. best can opening sound effects we've had on the show. I try to raise the bar time. a little bit every I th- time I, I do you, this. I think you, know? you did just now. That my, uh, was that my was sound effect technique is becoming uh, mighty. Yeah, it really is. And and as those of you who are regulars. With us here on Smoking and Toast, and no, we spare every expense when it comes to the sound effects that we use on the show. When we want the sound, an authentic sound of a can opening, we actually don't don't uh, don't shy back from using an authentic can. Yeah, we actually, it's a revolutionary idea. We actually open a real can. Yep. Yeah. Every single time. Bottles too, by the way. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. What you getting on the nose here? Anything? Beer. It's yeah, you know that's the it's thing. Classy beer. Yeah, Pilsner has the classic that, beer smell, doesn't it? That straw and hops, uh, slightly in the background, and then the malty, light malty kind of. I was going to say, are you getting any malt on the nose? Yeah, yeah, it's a little up front. It's interesting. It's yeah, got a, it's got a roundness on the nose that you don't expect. It's not real strong Mm-mm. on the nose, but it's there. Ooh, that's tasty. You know, uh, so interesting. It's a little maltier than I expected. For right a Pilsner, up front. yeah. And then instead of a hoppy snap, it's got a little tang on the back of it. What is that? What's the tang? I don't know. It's almost like a, almost like a uh, like a citrusy tang at the end of it. Yes, you're right. Not, but it doesn't not, cross. It not doesn't lemony. come across hoppy. It's not. No, I wouldn't say it's lemony. Really, you get almost a sense of the. Of the grains in the beer and the, um, you know, the malt for sure. It's not super malty, but it, it, it's definitely there. I I don't know. It tastes like you know the smell when you walk into a brewery. Mm-hmm. That beautiful right. malt. Where, where you're getting the smell. the smell of all the the raw ingredients of the beer. That's what this tastes like. You know what this kind of says to in me in a great way. You know what this kind of says to me, and. And I wonder if this isn't exactly what they did. It's almost like they said, let's make like a Miller or a Miller Lite, but not necessarily going for the light part. But let's make it taste really good. Let's yeah. do it right. This has a nice flavor to it. It's, I, I, I can think see it's this. very refreshing. I'm, I'm actually going to do this right now. I'm going to pour myself a little bit more, but not because I'm going to drink it right now. I want to actually let it warm up. So this isn't super cold. I, I no, love a, super, a cold. super cold Pilsner. But, but I'm willing to bet that this will stand up warmed up. So I'm actually going to set this aside. This is going to become a later test thing. Um, I'm trying to find that. One of my uh, CCSD brothers says he's... Uh, uh, is this the one he says he's tried? Mm. Oh no, it's Florida Man. Florida Man. Well, we'll no, get tried that. That's going to be our next one. And I'm looking forward to that big nice. time. Um, this is really nice. I would say uh, this is a crushable beer. Yeah, you got like a hundred points for crushable. 
Um, this is something that I should have for the uh, Shotgun Fridays. Oh, yeah. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Yes. <laughs> that, would actually be, uh, that would actually be a lot of fun. Kind of the end of an era in beer. The Magic Hat Brewing Company has left Vermont. Really? Now, I, I lived in Boston for quite some time. And anytime you're in uh, the states up in the Northeast, all the states are pretty close together. I used to drive to New Hampshire to buy cigars. It sounds like a big deal, but it was, you know, 40 minutes. You know, it was it was like not a not a big deal at all. And Vermont uh, is was home to some of the real early craft breweries, some of the ones that you know back before there were a gazillion breweries in mm -hmm. every uh, town. You know, in in Boston you had um, Boston Beer, Sam Adams. You had uh, Harpoon, which is a mm -hmm. great brewery, and then Magic Hat. You could always find Magic yeah. Hat, which was um, their Magic Hat Number no. Nine, which yep. has apricot flavor to it. It's like a, a staple. Like you could find that everywhere. Yeah. Well, Magic Hat has left Vermont, and there was a really interesting article that I found about the mark that they left on craft beer. And, and clearly, and by the way, Magic Hat's not going out of business. They're just moving. They they moved to a, to a new site. But in this article that I read, uh, it was something I, I I was not aware of. They called it uh, Ma uh, Magic Hat's spectacular misfire. And I wanted to tell you about this. Um, a while back in 2001, for the uh, annual Night of the Living Dead Halloween party that they used to throw at the brewery in Vermont, uh, the uh, brewery Magic Hat brewed a beer they called the Ale of the Living Dead. So nice. it's a great name, right? Yes. Um, the thing about it is, and these guys were always like so innovative. I mean, nobody was putting fruit flavors like apricot in a you know fairly mainstream kind of craft beer right, right. Uh, back when Magic Hat started doing so. They were always very innovative and very different. With the Ale of the Living Dead, they featured a piece of raw garlic in every clear bottle. <laughs> uh, it was, uh, according to the article, and I never tasted this, every bit as revolting as it sounds. It sounds terrible. Uh, Magic Hat co-founder and brewer Bob Johnson said, Ale of the Living Dead was the great debacle. He said, uh, he, and he gives credit slash blame for it uh, to Alan Newman, who is his co-founder. He says, I fought that one tooth and nail. I was like, this is not a good idea. And apparently within hours of the first delivery of this garlic beer to Pearl Street Beverage in Burlington uh, and Beverage Warehouse uh, in uh, Winooski, they called him to come take the cases back. <laughs> they said every bottle they sold had come back to them. I mean, think about that. How many beers have you bought and you've tasted and go, yeah, I don't really care for this. But you just like, even even when I had that terrible Dos Equis uh, uh, Mexican pale yeah, ale, yeah, the... I didn't take it back. I just poured poured them out and said, no. Yeah, don't you know, take that loss. Uh, I'll, yeah, right. That's on me. I tried something. It didn't work. That happens. Uh, but no, people were actually bringing, they said every bottle they sold had come back. It was undrinkable. This is the founder of the brewery <laughs> describing their own beer as uh, undrinkable. So it kind of became the stuff of legend. And then uh, later, uh, in later years, when customers would ask about it at their uh, at their shop that they had, their store in the uh, in the brewery, uh, employees were encouraged to explain that it was meant for cooking, not drinking. It, it wasn't. Um, they had a secret backstock of the concoction, and it was sometimes used to settle high stakes bets among the employees <laughs> of the brewery you lose you chug an ale of the living dead oh i just thought that was such a great story uh, and but but That's it goes awesome, yeah. it goes to show you that you know everything you experiment with doesn't always work yeah and hats off to magic hat no pun intended uh, just for how how innovative they were trying to be and they weren't afraid to like step out and do something really unusual. Yeah. And look, if if Goose Island had been afraid to do that when they were experimenting with what became their Bourbon County Stout, yeah, it, we would have never had this whole style of beer, or Brett Nemiases, or Brett Nemiases, yeah. yeah. So anyway, I thought that was a great story. Ooh. I want to do uh, share that. All right, let's take a quick break, Ian. We're going to come back, and I'm really anxious to. Uh, taste this Florida man, the uh, the new double IPA from Cigar City Brewing. I have not had a beer from Cigar City Brewing that I didn't think was really outstanding. All their beers are great. Yeah. Do you want? Uh, do you think your um, Parish Lager has warmed up enough that you want to try it yet and see if it's see if it's any different? 
Yeah, actually, I, so I only poured a little bit. Let's see mm-hmm. what happened. I will say mine a little bit warmer. I got more malt on the front. This is fine. It's This is flat and uh, only slightly cooler than room temperature, and it's still delicious. It, and it was not flat when we poured it, by no, the way. No, not uh, at all. So that's just from it sitting uh, sitting out in, in the uh, cup. But um, I think Parrish has got another winner. These guys... Yeah, they when you can build on. when you can build a lager that stands up to being warm and flat. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on. Yeah, when's the last time you had a uh, a macro beer lager warm and flat and didn't go? Yeah, you better get me. That's a cold why one. the cold activated can is an early warning system. <laughs> that's, that's right, right? Because if those if those mountains ain't blue, yeah. stay oh, far, oh, run far away. away. Run yeah. Away. All right, we'll take a break. We'll be right back with a little uh, Florida Man Plus. Uh, the Brewers Association. <laughs> has named the uh, recipients of their 2020 Industry Awards some breweries and brewers, and we want to uh, note and congratulate those Let's guys. Let's do it. So we'll do that next. It's uh, smoking and Toasting. Welcome back. It's smoking and toasting. We're so glad to have you on show number one hundred and what did I say? Is it one hundred ninety-two today? Is that Halfway what we are? Two hundred. Uh, one ninety-two. Yes, that's us. Uh, we're so glad to have you on the program. And by the way, if you enjoy the show, uh, which amazingly some people actually do, um, make sure I you enjoy it. yeah make sure you subscribe to us in uh, the podcast uh, place of choice, uh, yes. Apple podcasts or um the uh, google play yes uh, you can also go and subscribe directly on soundcloud we're on there mm-hmm. and then we have a youtube uh, we have youtube channel. please go on youtube and hit the like and subscribe button on there it will let you know even if you don't watch it on youtube do it anyway it's a favor for us yeah i know that you know every time you watch a, a video on youtube these days whoever the host of the video is is constantly saying Hey, subscribe, hit the bell so you'll be notified. And yeah, it does get a little tiresome, so yeah. we try not to like overdo that. But it does help us out if you do that. So if you enjoy the show, help us out, subscribe. Like Ian said, even if you don't watch the show on YouTube, go yeah. and subscri- go do subscribe it anyway. anyway. It, didn't hurt, it didn't hurt a thing, and it, it helps us. The uh, worst it helps case scenario, it adds us to your feed, and that's okay. Yeah, and that's not a bad thing. All right, did you know, Ian, the world needs heroes. And in Cigar City Brewing's home state of Florida, that's, that's not what um, that's not what um, what's her name said in the eighties. She said she was holding out for a hero. Oh, that's right. that's what she was doing. But so she would probably agree with the sentiment. <laughs> I was but, thinking of Tina Turner. We don't oh, need another oh, hero. we don't need another hero. Yeah, See, yeah. and what, you were going for what uh, horrible thing does it say about me that I went to Bonnie <laughs> Tyler instead Bonnie of Tyler. Tina Turner? I'm so ashamed. Right now, I should be. Half the people be, listening are going, "What the hell's a Bonnie Tyler?" I, I just, I just <laughs> lost half my pay for the show, and since I don't really make anything for the show, it's not a, it's not a big hit. There's but, that. Uh, but, uh, but yeah. Uh, so the world, according to Cigar City Brewing, the world needs heroes, and in their home state of Florida, only a very special hero will do. Maybe that's why I was holding out for you. I holding kind of put that in my hero, in yeah. my mind. A hero with a shark tooth around his neck. A grim reaper tattoo on his arm. A rap sheet longer than his mama's mustache. <laughs> a hero who's forgotten more about amateur taxidermy and alligator wrestling than you'll ever know. <laughs> what are the things that, you know, people who are not from Florida, when they think of Florida, they think of like Miami you yeah. know, and South Beach. Yeah, or yeah. maybe they Don think Johnson. of Orlando and Disney World. Yeah. There are pockets of that in Florida. But they're but, just pockets. But they're just pockets. Most of Florida <laughs> is more about amateur taxidermy and alligator wrestling. Um, anyway, they say, what better way to pay tribute to our beloved Florida man than with a big old double India pale ale brewed with a nearly criminal amount of hops and a moderate bitterness that just about matches Florida man's general disposition. Uh, this hopped-up whopper of a beer is big in character and guaranteed to sear itself into your memory just like the world's worst superhero, Florida Man. Florida Man. I just had to read that because I thought it was so good. That's I've from, got to get a shirt now. That's from, Oh, yeah, it's it's the best. Uh, that's from the uh, website. And by the way, if you're interested, uh, you can go to uh, CigarCityBrewing.com, and if you go to the Florida Man uh, page, which is what I just read from, uh, you can click Shop the Merch, and it takes you to the page with their beer-branded merchandise, which includes the Florida Man shirt. And uh, I think it's I the, think it's the just label on this can is brilliant. First off, it's that 
Florida blue kind of. Yep. And it's thing. got the welcome the, to the Florida. The whole bottom of the can is like uh, alligator print. Yeah. Right. And <laughs> right, then yeah, like alligator hide. Yeah, alligator hide. And then the and then the uh, and then the the printed picture on here has welcome to Florida, sunshine state. Across the top, it has some. It has like a little cabin and a and a mobile home, like a trailer home, and a big old um, truck. Then it's got an alligator crushing a beer can on it. It's actually <laughs> like this is fun it, and the great. sun yeah. in the background with a couple palm trees. Well, you know, and swampy land all the way around. Different breweries are using different approaches with their can or bottle art, and I really love the ones that take it just a really. Offbeat and fun approach, and Cigar City is really, fun really good at doing that. Yeah, I mean, well, it's a little tongue in cheek too because it's the whole Florida man thing. <laughs> their pale ale is called Gaibara, which is named after the the shirts. You know those shirts that cigar rollers wear right. that have the they're not like double breasted, but they have that the panels. The panels, yeah. yeah, they have like the double panels on them. That's awesome. So, so it says uh, Florida man double India pale ale, unpredictable varieties of hops used in near criminal volumes combined to create a bold citrusy double IPA, brewed to pay tribute to the world's worst superhero, Florida man. Florida man, yeah, definitely. Cigar City Brewing, drink fresh, do not age. Um, so you know, usually double IPAs will age pretty well, but you know, I'm going to take their word for it, and I'm going to open it because we shouldn't let it age anymore. Let's do it. That's one thing about IPAs, friends. They are not meant to be cellared. They're meant to be consumed no, IPA as fresh. fresh as possible. Yeah. That's why Oh it, wow. If Smell you're, that. If you're even remotely an IPA fan, as soon as the breweries open up and you're allowed to go and and you know, uh, have stuff from the tap room, that is the perfect time to have an IPA when it's on tap from the tap fresh. room. It's it's just that's when IPAs are at their absolute best. And you always want to you know, make sure you're not getting an old dusty can or bottle if you're shopping IPAs. At, so this at smells your local spot. like a citrusy fruit basket. It doesn't like it smell. smells sweet and citrusy. It doesn't smell. They were talking about it being an insane amount of hops. It doesn't smell hoppy on the nose. It smells pretty hoppy to me. Well, I'm I'm getting more citrus than hops. It just also smells hops. sweeter in front of the hops, yeah. which is really interesting. It, it doesn't it doesn't have on the nose. It doesn't have that sort of hop bitterness that that some IPAs will have even it's, on uh, the nose. Just just from looking at it, it's pretty well carbonated too. And it also looks pretty uh, pretty hazy, which I wasn't necessarily expecting. So, wow. Hmm. That punches you in the face. Your thoughts, sir. I, now, now <laughs> if you're not familiar with the show, I'm the IPA guy. I love him. Ian likes some IPAs, but is really, really struggles with the ones that are overly hopped or that that the hop, you know, hop bitterness kind of stays with you. So I'm real curious. I, I can already tell you I love this, but how does this strike you? This is um, everything it said on the label. Wow, the finish on this is. Bitter hop and oddly sweet. Yeah, there's a there's a weird underlying bitterness that sits on the back of the tongue, even past all the sweetness. Mm -hmm. It hits your palate like that. Remember, we had a beer a couple weeks ago that I said, remember that athletic gum you used to get like at uh, uh, at Academy or one right, of the sports right. stores that would make your mouth really really water. Yeah, yeah, it does that to like my yeah. mouth is just. Slavering, slathering, whatever, whatever the word, slathering, Sla slathering, whatever it is. Yeah. Anyway, my mouth is doing that thing. Like, do you just, like it? I don't know yet. Uh, <laughs> I don't. I don't. I love it. I don't want to stop drinking. It's like one. It's like you know. Sometimes you eat something so spicy that when you stop eating it, it's too spicy. Mm -hmm. But this kind of does that to my palate. Like I don't know if I want to stop drinking it. My God, it, it, it's the bitter is building up in the back of my mouth. Yeah, I know what you mean. Um, it, it kind of hangs with you after after the finish. <laughs> this uh, it's hoppy up front too. Right. It's not like it's not like malty up front and then hoppy. It kind of it kind of sucks you it's in the hop, taste buds, and then right the middle away. of it is hop, and then the end of it is. Like a different kind of hop roll off, so <laughs> I think it's probably good for what it is. I don't think I would drink more than one at a time. Is it too resiny for you? I, it's a little too resiny for me. This is not my flavor. So although it looks very hazy, uh, it doesn't 
come across to me like a lot of the juicy IPAs, even though there is some definite it's, citrus. It's got a pineapple-y undertone it to does, it. It does, doesn't it? There you go. It's a pine, but like not sweet pineapple, like fruity, like pineapple right next to the husk, you know, kind of. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Like, like what a pineapple, pineapple smells pineapple like after you've cut a real of, one open. Yes. You know? Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. I had a, a pineapple smoothie IPA earlier this week, and this is nothing like that. It had a, uh, you know, a, a, a sort of that sweet, you know, uh, sort of pillows of flavor kind of pineappleiness to it. This is a more, I don't want to, the word stringent isn't quite right, but it's a more, uh, oh, it's, a it's got more of a snap, a like, snap to and it. And it's dry. Like, now yes, that I'm is. done drinking it, it's dry and I need chapstick. <laughs> like, it is dry. Well, I, I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing, but I, this is not something I'd reach for a second one, I think. Well, I and definitely so my, I definitely would. My buddy Nick on here one. said he'd tried it. What is what is your opinion on there, Nick? You got to uh, type that in. Let me see what you say about I, it. Yeah, I, I think it's fantastic. I, I, I like it because... They they brewed a double where they didn't go down the typical, let's make this an orange juice IPA or, yeah. or you know or a pineapple smoothie Agreed. Agreed. IPA. And I like those. Don't get me wrong. This is not a West Coast, no, nor Ab- a New England no, style absolutely IPA. Not. It's, this it's is its t- own thing. It's a Tampa, Florida, Florida <laughs> man IPA. <laughs> this and, is its own. Thing. And I dig it. This will become a regular for me. I may. Uh, it may be something that I grow to like. I just don't know. Like I. I don't know. Like Question. Initially, this will wreck any cigar oh, you no, try to have with it. Oh, no, this is not. Florida man is not smoking a cigar while he's enjoying this <laughs> no. beer. That's for sure. <laughs> I, I, let me ask you a question, Ian. If if something becomes like a regular, if it becomes a go-to, like how many of those are you allowed to have? This is just beer guy talk, right? Uh, like, Because I've noticed that a lot of the things we've tried on here, if I've really liked them, I'm like, yeah, this is going to be a new go-to for me, or this is going to become a regular. So a go-to. Do you, do you have to lose some go-tos to go-to, add another one? Oh, I see what you're saying. How many How many can you have that variety? at one time that you right. say this is a go-to for me? Well, a go-to is different from a regular. Right? A regular is what's readily available that you grab because it's easy. And like sometimes I walk into a place and I'm like, I want a beer, but I don't want to go through a lot of thought process. So I'll right. grab... 805, for instance. Right, which is a great 805, or uh, right now, Summer Pills from St. Arnold is is out, and that's a great beer. Um, I'll I'll grab beers like that because I'm like, you know what? I don't want to think about my beer right now. I just want to grab something that's fun and delicious. That, to me, is a uh, a go-to. However, uh, or or, or something that, you know, like, like my regular drinker, but... But like a go to is when you see it, you're like, okay, I'm getting that, right? You know, and you can have, I think, as many as you want. It depends on your refrigerator size. Now, <laughs> yes, it does. Or if you have a second beer fridge. Yeah, yeah. So I have a full size second beer fridge. Yeah. So my I, unfortunately, go-tos, I don't. I've, I have in the past. I but. would like to say it's full of beer, but the problem is, I put beer in it. As often as I take beer out of right, it. and this this causes an <laughs> inverse effect. All right, so I need to actually overbalance that on the putting it in part. It's well, like my cigar humidor as well, you know. Well, I made the kind of purchase that you were just talking about this week. I was picking up some things for the show, and I was in my specs in Midtown, and I almost on impulse picked up a can, a, a case rather, or, or one of the carry the fifteen pack case of. The um, founders all day IPA. Yeah, nothing wrong with that. Now it's a great IPA. It's 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 uh, sessionable, and it's something that I would have said this is a go to for me. But I realized as I was grabbing the uh, the fifteen pack of it, I ha- I haven't bought this in months. Right, like maybe even a year since I right. bought some of this. And yet I would tell you, that's a go to for me. So I'm wondering. Maybe now it's a go-to again because I bought a 15-pack. But but is it, did that one kind of drop off my go-to list because I was adding other go-tos? Well, but to there's them? also a mood thing. Like, I'm going to be honest with you. If I walk into a beer store and I go, okay, I'm going to grab a six-pack of something, there's a high probability that it's going to be Dirty Bastard. 
So that's a go to for that's you. That's an absolute go to for that's me. That's such a great beer. It but, is such but a great I don't beer. Know it's also it's like a, eight or nine percent. But yeah. I don't know it's a go to for a lot of people for that reason. Right. You know, it's it's, right. it's more of a for me, I love that, but that's more of a specialty when I'm in the mood. Generally for it. speaking though, I don't sit down and drink consecutive a bunch of those. Now it happens, but I don't generally do that. <laughs> Careful what you say. You're you're treading right, you're right. treading lightly on the Normally truth what I'd say is I have something in my fridge that's more along the lines of what I say the eight oh five earlier or something like the summer pills or something like that in my fridge that's gonna break that up. So a lot of times I'll start an evening with a beer like Dirty Bastard and then I'll go to something a little lighter. And See, it, it's funny, I do it the opposite. I start lighter uh, and I go heavier. Kind of like we do here on the show, generally. Yeah. So, it, see, uh, if I don't go lighter, because the problem get, I have, if I start, trouble. if I start yeah. lighter, I can keep going heavier and justify it, right? And I got, <laughs> you know, I got beers that are 14 percent in my fridge. Oh, I've got some double IPA in there. It's some of the uh, triple, the uh, uh, Dogfish Head. Oh yeah, the one twenty. The one twenty minute IPA. Yeah. That's like eighteen percent. So I could right. keep going. So I usually do it the other way around. I think. Well. So this raises another question then. For guys, and I know you and I both do this, I would assume a lot of the people who listen to the show do this, we generally buy not just like the same beer all the time, but we buy a lot of different kinds of beers. So let's say it's an evening and you're going to have a few beers. Do you start with a beer and kind of stay with that beer or do you always change up? Do you always have one, and then you go to something completely different? I don't consciously and try to do after that. Try to do either. A lot of times, uh, every time I go to my fridge, it's like a "what am I doing?" thing. So sometimes Which I'll grab the same thing. A wonderful decision, by the way. Yeah, sometimes I'll grab the same thing. Sometimes I'll grab something different. It just depends on my mood. Um, so it just varies. I but I'm not a I, I'm not a unless it's the only beer I have. I'm not. A, I'm just going to drink the same flavor over and over again. Even when I go float down the river, which I haven't done this year, by the way, mm -hmm. even when I go float down the river, my cooler has, you know, three or four kinds of beer in there. Right. When everyone else I'm hanging out with, a lot of times generally just has Lone Star. I will, I will, because I just like different flavors, and then it's kind of right. like a whatever I grab. You know? Whatever you're in the mood for, speaking whatever of, you grab. Speaking of which, Nick, uh, uh, Responded uh, about responded, Florida Man. He said uh, about Florida Man. He said, very hoppy with the malt backbone. It's an absolute kick in the teeth with various kind of hops. Agreed. Yes. Um, the the malt in here is is a secondary thing. I feel um, it's actually a little more viscous than it initially uh -huh. looked. When you look at it a little bit in the glass, he also says front and back were a notable combination of citra, and I wanted to guess Galaxy hops. The middle has that pineapple rind feel, so I'm not the only one. Yep. Yep. Feeling that champagne dry, which actually helps the hops not stick around. That you're right about that. Right, like, right. The, so it makes the beers it, that aren't as dry uh, on the finish like that. Right. The hops, if they're as much as is in this, will definitely stick around longer. Right. So, so I, I don't know. It's a little. I don't not like it, but I don't think I'd go for it. Super thumbs up for me. I I dig it. This this will become well a regular for me. I actually uh, I like it a little warmer. It's well, more pineapple-y when it's warm. Some people are like that with IPAs. I am that guy that wants my beer ice cold. My favorite, unless it's maybe a darker beer. It's so dry. I my need some chapstick. favorite beer. My favorite way to drink beer is when you pour it into an icy glass, and the ice crystals form on the top. Not. I don't want. It, I don't want <laughs> chunks of ice, but those little ice crystals. To me, that's when beer is uh just wonderful. okay. You remember when uh, when I did the show from. Um, from, from Tucson, uh, Tucson, and I made the, uh, and I made the uh, martini. You made a martini, yes, right. And they were, and uh, Chris was like, "Is that thing carbonated? What did you do?" No, it was the ice, ice oh, crystals. Because I shook that thing. Also, how martinis are, are the best. So for like the rag that I used around the shaker was frozen to the shaker. <laughs> that's you know, like great. that's how much you shake it. I've been out uh, to dinner or, or drinks with people. And they'll order a martini, and I was going to get something else. Their martini arrives, and it has the ice crystals on the top, like yeah, you're talking about. Yeah. I immediately switch to martinis. Yes. Just because I love Because they're great. Yeah, you just got to yeah. shake them like crazy. Well, uh, tell you what we're going to do. We're going to take a quick break. We're going to come back. We have some whiskey to taste. We've been talking about uh, the fact that today we would get into why single-barrel bourbon is such a big deal. And we'll do that next how is that going back to the Shiner after the double IPA, by the way? It makes Shiner taste a little bit like, you know, one of those unsweetened uh, flavored waters. 
Yeah. It's like if you had one of those that was malt. <laughs> so, they should totally do that. That should be the next hard seltzer is just like malt Malt, ball. malt hard <laughs> seltzer. <laughs> All right. We'll be right back with a little uh, with a little single barrel bourbon and why that's such a big deal. Coming up next on Smoking and Toast. Welcome back. It's Smoking and Toasting. This is the program that's all about craft beer, fine spirits, and hand rolled cigars. We're so glad to have you on the program. It's number 192, and we're brought to you by B&B Butchers and Restaurant at 1814 Washington Ave in Houston. That's Washington. I think I said Washington. Washington. Washington Ave in Houston, and in the shops at Clear Fork in Fort Worth. They are open as local and state uh, uh, laws allow. They're uh, socially distanced with the tables. Yesterday and... was my wife's birthday. Oh, happy birthday, Tiffany. And so instead of taking her out, because everything's just so, a lot of places are socially weird. Mm-hmm. And and, uh, and frankly, you know, a lot of us haven't been working. So mm-hmm. that's that's been a little tough. So I opted to, There's you know that. what, I'm going to do as special as I can make it at home. So I went shopping. And one of my stops was at B&B Butcher's. Uh, and I bought the Chef Tommy bacon kit. To take home to and take make. take home so, and make. So here's the big question. You've had the Chef Tommy's at b and yes. prepared by their guys. Yes. So how did the home version compare? So the directions on this are very simple, by the way. Okay. Heat oven to 350, cook for 15 minutes, put some uh, blue cheese that comes in the kit on mm-hmm. it, put it in for another five minutes, and then... Serve basically. Oh, drain the grease in there after you heat it. By the way. Oh, and then you put the truffle honey on top. On top when it's when it's cooked. Yes. Now, uh, so there's three ingredients to this. Is four giant slabs of bacon. Oh yeah. When we talk bacon, by the way, this is not thin and crispy bacon. Yeah. This is like a quarter of an inch. Thick. You know, I, I should have put a picture of it on here. I have a picture that I sent to my brother of the bacon that uh, I can. Maybe if you send that to Adam real quick, you can the post camera. it. At least show the camera. But uh, here, I'll forward it to Adam right now. Okay. Maybe he can post that up. I don't know how long that takes him to do, but he should be able yeah, to. Yeah, it's it. probably going to be outside of this uh, realm. So let's let's go ahead and shelf that for the moment. But uh, I'll do that uh, a little later. But um, anyway, it's four ridiculously thick slices of bacon. Of bacon. Um, so I have one thing I would say. I would cook it hotter next time. Okay. And a little bit longer. Okay. Um, but uh, but that was okay. That was easy to do on the spot. We cooked it for the 15 minutes, and I said, that's not enough. So I actually doubled the time on it. I flipped the bacon, drained the grease, flipped the bacon, doubled the time, and it turned out outstanding. So it was as good, made with the kit, yes. as what you've experienced. Yes, and I think what I would do next time is uh, I would, in, instead of the 350 they recommend, I would go 400 or 425. And I would probably do it for 12 minutes or close to that, right. and then drain and flip, and then do double that, and then serve it. It'll probably be, make the bacon, make the grease, or the fat a little bit poppier. Uh, but man, it was so good. I, after two pieces of bacon, because there was four pieces total, after two pieces of bacon, I was pretty full. Yeah, and the right. blue cheese oh, that they have is very so filling. good. Not all blue cheese is created equal. Yes. And their blue cheese is so good. Oh, yeah. That's that's a thing, too. You can you can try making it on your own, and it could be that you didn't buy the right blue cheese to achieve that you know, yeah. that, that thing. So, Plus, and just another funny thing about the butcher shop at B&B. I walked in, and they have it in their cold case. They have a box of it. Okay? But the cold case was locked for whatever reason. I guess they just opened it. Or I don't know what deal was but they had a lock on the cold case so i walked up to the counter and i said gentlemen i'd like a chef tommy bacon kit and he goes okay and he just walks the other direction and then he goes and gets the bacon and he slices it and he puts it in a oh nice so you're getting fresh it's literally not off the shelf it's he goes and gets the bacon and and does the uh, shrink wrap or whatever you call it, the, the fresh seal wrap yep, around yep. it. And then he goes and gets a couple little cups and puts your blue cheese. Puts your Like, that's nice. how you get 
<laughs> nice. I love it. I it was, love it was it. awesome. I, I got to do that because would, that would just be so impressive. Like, your wife must have been totally impressed. So good. Yeah, she was super happy. <laughs> that, and I got her some little veal cutlets. That, nice. Not veal, but um, uh, lamb cutlets lamb that were cutlets, just yep. outstanding. So. Delicious stuff. Uh, I used to subscribe uh, to Paste Magazine. I don't subscribe to a lot of magazines anymore, and I think a lot of people don't because they have a tendency to just stack up, and I'm always reading on the computer or the iPad anyway when I'm reading. So uh, I do, though, spend quite a bit of time on Paste's uh, website, and I get their regular emails, and they do everything from you know music stuff to TV reviews. Yeah. Occasionally they'll uh, have an article, an interesting article about uh, craft beer or spirits. And uh, their latest uh, article that I read that I really enjoyed was uh, basically about you know what's the deal with single barrel bourbon? Why is it why is it a thing? Why is it you know becoming so popular inside the the uh, world of spirits? And I thought the article was really good. First, they describe single barrel, but like what is it? And a simple definition: single barrel is exactly what the name implies. It means that a bottle. Only contains whiskey that came from one right. barrel. Now, why is that unusual, or or why is that different? When you're when you're buying a, a bourbon or a whiskey that's not single barrel, is that whiskey potentially from different barrels, even if it's the same uh, kind of whiskey? So what happens is this: because because is it, in, uh, obviously in a, a blended a blended whiskey obviously isn't single barrel. Well, uh, but there are other whiskeys that so are also. So understand this: uh, blended whiskey uh, generally means that it's got whiskeys blended from different distilleries. Mm -hmm. uh, and somebody can correct me if I'm wrong on any part of this, but it comes from different distilleries, and that doesn't make it bad. Blended whiskeys are great. Like uh, there's some there's some pretty awesome blended whiskeys out there. Just search for them. You know, mm -hmm. there are. Uh, they get a bad rep because blended. Seems to have a. Bad it seems name. like it's inferior yeah, it's like in some way. Blended yeah. is inferior, but there's some great stuff out there. And another thing about it too is keep in mind the price point on a blended whiskey. A blended whiskey is generally not as expensive. Right. But why do we blend whiskey? The same reason we blend tobacco. The same reason we blend seasoning is to get a consistent flavor. Well, that's right. The article says when a company like Jim Beam creates a batch of flagship bourbon like uh, Jim Beam White Label. They need it to taste exactly like the previous batch. That's right. So what they have to do then is they have to take their barrels that they've made their thousands of gallons of this mm -hmm. uh, liquid in, and they have to average the flavor to 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 that. They have to have a a, a blender or a, yeah, a, a distiller master. Yeah, distiller. Make, sorry, a, yeah, master distiller come in and say okay. If we take this much of this and this much of this, now this is all generally in house because it's not a blended whiskey, right? It's a whiskey, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and so from barrels within the house, that's not considered a blended whiskey. That's a whiskey that they they take from their in house and blend to that flavor profile. Right. That way, when you go buy a bottle of Jim Beam or you go buy a bottle of uh, Maker's Mark or you go right. buy a bottle of any, you insert any name here. That tastes consistent from bottle to bottle to bottle to bottle to bottle. Right. The master distiller has come up with a specific flavor, right. a specific taste that is this brand. In the world where every single thing that you put into that was variable. Right. Now, you try to keep it the same, but the you know stuff grows different from well, year to year. Yeah, and it, there's an incredible array, it says in the article, of different chemical processes that are happening in any given barrel of whiskey. Mm -hmm. They all directly affect maturation speed, flavor profile, degree of evaporation, something they say as simple as how high a whiskey barrel in a rickhouse is in in the rack. Can change the flavor can dramatically. Can change, yeah, can change temperature control. Uh, evaporation. Well, you might think, okay, so if you got a you've got a, a whiskey warehouse and you've got whiskey barrels that are twenty feet up in the air on a rack, that's hotter, right, than it is when they're on the ground. Temperature is different. Evaporation that's, is different. Lots of those things are different. The airflow is different. There's a lot of different things. So, the thing about single barrels, we think single barrel it must be special because it comes from one place. Well, a little bit, yes, because when they offer a single barrel offering. First off, it's a limited run because you only have 
one a barrel. single yeah, barrel. Exactly. Okay. Now you may or may not like that single barrel, but the bottom line is it is a, a limited run, and it's going to be so. Unique. Therefore, uh, therefore, that's gonna that could create more demand. Those kind of things. Um, and and what that means is they picked one barrel out of there. That's why when you see the barrel select, yeah, there's a barrel select is a very uh, popular thing right now. Stores will do it for their own stores. Um, societies, Houston Bourbon Society does that right. for bottles. Chris and those guys yeah. love to go and pick and, a barrel. And what and, that means is you go sample the different barrels, and every barrel is going to have a little bit different. Even if you put mm. the exact same liquid in, every everyone's going to taste a little different. Right. And you pick your barrel that tastes this unique. So when you scale back the number of barrels in a batch, you invite more unique flavors yes. because of the differences. And that's where we get small batch bourbons. Elijah Craig, Four yes. Roses Small Batch, 1792 Small Batch, are all implied to have subtle variations from batch to batch. They will. Yeah. Every one of them. So will. you might buy a Four Roses Small Batch. You might buy another one a year from now. And it may not taste exactly the same. Because it came from a different small batch. it came from a different small batch, exactly. Now, characteristic-wise, it'll be in the same flavor palette generally. Right. But it might not be the exact same thing because the barrels right. are different. Everything's different. So, so single-barrel bourbons take that to a, an even more extreme, basically. There's the regular one where they blend to get the consistent flavor. Right. Then there's small, small batch. batch. And then the we next want to use extension. these barrels to right. create this one profile. Right. This is all we're going to make. And then the next logical extension is Your single barrel. Single barrel. So right. that's why this is such a uh, uh, such a big trend because there's a uniqueness to it. Yes. Uh, it, if you stumble across one that you really love, it's like, oh, I really found a good one. Yeah. And you buy know? as much of it as you can because. There is no more. It's kind of like you know, uh, kind of like I was about you know. Nola made that uh, we are liquid I- hazy IPA that yeah. I love so much. I found out that it was a limited release, and I immediately went to the store and bought a whole bunch of it uh, so yeah. I could be stocked up. Now you can't buy too much with an IPA because yeah, you, you got to drink, drink it fresh, fresh, right? But but it's the same concept. At least with uh, with the single barrel stuff, you find something you like, you can go get it. You know, as much as you can afford to get at the time. And it'll and it'll store. Uh, it'll store. Well, pretty the well. nice thing about whiskey is it stays good in a bottle. Yeah, yeah, exactly, you know. exactly. So, uh, so single barrel bourbons are available in a wider range of prices than you might expect. Just because a bourbon is single barrel doesn't necessarily mean that it's particularly expensive, and they can also range from eighty proof all the way through cask strengths of 130, 140 yeah. proof. So uh, ultimately, the, the single barrel category, they say, is almost as broad as the bourbon uh, category itself. Now, Ian, I'm going to go through this article, and they recommend some entry-level, some mid-shelf price, and splurgy single barrel bourbons. Can we, while can I we do that, drink while we do that? Yeah, while I do that, why don't you open that bad boy up, and, and let's do some sampling. At the entry level, which they describe as roughly... Twenty-five to forty dollars a, uh, a a a bottle. Uh, the Jim Beam single barrel, the Henry McKenna ten-year bottled in bond, and the Evan Williams single barrel are their uh, are their recommendations. Um, it in the mid shelf, which they describe as uh, roughly forty to sixty dollars, they recommend the Four Roses single barrel. Which, by the way, is wonderful. Yes. Uh, the Wild Turkey Kentucky Spirit single barrel, and the Knob Creek single barrel select bourbon. That Knob Creek is very good. In the sixty dollar and beyond, a uh, sixty dollar and far beyond category or splurgy. That was very subtle, but very nice. It was. Yeah, <laughs> I liked it. Uh, they recommend uh, the uh, Blanton single barrel. Always good. The, if you can uh, ever find it. The Baker's single barrel, Maker, Maker's Mark uh, Private Select. Nothing also. wrong with that. And they also recommend, hello Jessica, the Barrel Bourbon single barrel. Barrel Bourbon's awesome. I, I hope she's still with us because uh, that was a completely unplanned, um, you know, shout out to her brand. Um, and bring some of that next time because it's awesome. <laughs> um, fill you there. So, so there are their, uh, there are their, you know, their recommendations. Now, this one that we're drinking, this distillery is in College Station, and it's the Rio Brazos Distillery. It's, We've had their boxcar. And I believe we liked it a lot. It was way back in show 39, so I don't know 
how distinctly I remember it, but I want to say I remember liking it. You're, so you're smelling your hands got, after touching like, the cork. This court. happens sometimes. If you get a little on your hands, sometimes I'll rub it in uh, from hand to hand, and uh, it smells like wood. Like Ooh. very, very wood smell kind of thing on the hands. It's interesting how well, that works. There's a very woody smell on the nose just uh, just when you're uh, doing a little inhale on the cup, Look, too. There's a little drip on a bottle. Rub mm-hmm. that in your hands right there. I think you'll be amazed. It's like hand how, sanitizer. Yeah. I'll be, you'll be amazed at how woody that smells like. Oh, wow. It's it's almost like... Like wood chips, yeah. Yeah, I was going to say wood paneling, and then I realized that's not necessarily a positive uh, <laughs> Apparently thing. Apparently I spilled a bunch over wood here. Wood so chips is I barrel. just smell like the, the hand better. sanitizer. But anyway, uh, Rio Brazos Distiller, single barrel Texas bourbon whiskey distilled by Rio Brazos Distillery, College Station, 750 milliliters. So in this particular case, this is a single barrel that Specs, which is our, you know, is my favorite place to shop for spirits, these guys picked this particular barrel, and it was bottled just for them. So, so this is not necessarily something that you could go out and get uh, unless you live in uh, an area with the specs. But it is kind of indicative of what this distillery can do. So I thought that would be fun. Now, I'm, I'm taking this uh, right on the nose. Yeah. Um, so first off, it smells nice. It's got that woody smell that you get, like what we're getting off our hands. It's mm-hmm. got that woody smell going on, a little undercurrent sweetness. A uh, caramely kind of smell going on. It doesn't smell as high proof as it is. This is fifty seven point five percent, or or um, you know, double that for your for your proof. Yeah, proof. Fifty seven point five percent is pretty big. Yeah, like that's that's a hot whiskey right there. Just under one hundred twenty. Uh, bottle so. one seventeen, aged one year. Mm hmm. So uh, I'm interested to see what you get when you, have you taste because I have just tried it. Yes. I don't want to prejudice you here, so you are much more the whiskey expert than I. So, mm. that wood chip—it's—it's it's one of the woodsiest whiskeys I've ever. It had. is so woodsy, yeah. Uh, and then it's backed by caramel and brown sugar. Mm-hmm. There's a sweetness that lays right dead center in the back of your uh, tongue. And that's cinnamon and brown sugar. It's definitely got the impact. You were saying it doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily smell like it's high proof. It drinks like it's high proof. You can feel that impact uh, on the back of the palate. And then there's a really nice, subtle, but really nice whiskey hug. That there's a maple you. syrupy taste. Yes. But, um, but it's almost like maple syrup that you poured out of a wooden decanter because there's so much woodsiness to this or woodiness to this. And it, by the way, I mean it in a very positive way. This is um, this is delicious. Ian, you know how when you're barbecuing or, or grilling and you've got some really good wood that you're using and the fire, not the smoke, but the fire, has that rich wood smell yeah. as it burns. If you take that and apply it to a beverage, that that's what I get. It's more, and it's it's extremely pleasing. It's not campfire. No, it's 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 wood. It's the richness of the wood. It's, it it's, smells. It's amazing. like when you walk it out. Great. It's like when you walk out in your backyard and like somebody in the neighborhood's cooking. Right, right. Even if they haven't put the meat on the grill yet or the veggies you, on the grill. Like the wood in this. I know it's oak because I feel that oak astringency going on. But it almost has a pecan smoke. Yes. Just a just a hint of it, like totally pecan maple syrup. Um, Brown sugar, and there's something else in vanilla, vanilla, a lot of vanilla right up front, and there's something else that I'm just. This is very different to me, uh, more different than I was expecting. It's very minerally. Mm-hmm. Um, There's something in there that I just can't quite put my finger on. It's maybe a dark fruit or a. Yeah, I could get that. 
We could go with raisiny. That's been working for us today. <laughs> uh, but it's, it's not really raisiny, but there is something in there, like a darker dried fruit yeah, uh, note that is... Uh, I'll tell you what, Ian, this is very good. But this is this is a bottle... You'd have to watch yourself with this one. Like, I can tell from just the yeah. first couple of sips. I'd be interested to see what this tastes like with a couple splashes of water or even an ice cube. Yes. We might even try that. Just I may, I may leave a little in the cup. Grab a little water uh, yeah. during the break and try that because it's certainly. I bet this opens up in a beautiful, like, I bet it blossoms. It's certainly proofed enough to withstand that without question. Well, you know, there's there's always drinkers out there like, oh, I never water anything down. I always try everything at full strength. Yeah. Uh, but then a lot of times I add water because I like to see what it does. I like to see how it does. And sometimes you get a lot of flavors that you just can't get at full strength. Right. Right. Well, the single barrel uh, craze, the single barrel trend, is definitely worth uh, enjoying. You rocked it on this one. This is this is a great one. Yeah, uh, this is really a great one. Real Brazos in What's College the Station. What's price point on this? I believe it was a between forty and fifty. Yep. So it would be what they called the mid level in the. Uh, and I would say flavor wise, I'd one hundred percent. Yeah, it's good. It's really, really good. And I'll tell you, the guys at Rio Brazos, I mean, this is in College Station. I mean, I... I right up the road. That's, that's where my brother went to school. And I always tell him, you know, you don't have to put the A&M sticker on your car. I understand that not everyone can get in to the University of Texas. <laughs> but you don't have to put the sticker on your car. So I'm, I'm making fun of, of A&M and College Station, but just to say... Above and beyond the college, and I'm really just joking, you guys. Don't don't send me hate mail. <laughs> Above and beyond the college, there's some really interesting things going on in College Station. Some great uh, breweries there, yeah. and this distillery. I mean, these guys. The boxcar. I remember we liked boxcar that. Boxcar was good, yeah. And this is this is spectacular. So my message to you, if you're in, um, uh, if you're in the greater Houston area, and you can get your hands on a bottle, try it. Yeah. And if you are uh, are not. Uh, be on the lookout for the boxcar because it's it's made with the same kind of craft yep. craftsmanship. Quite good. Yes, absolutely. All right, we're going to take a break. We'll be back with our uh, last segment in segment number five on smoking and toasting number one ninety two. We're going to taste a Bishop's Barrel. It's St. Arnold's special concoction. They do two special series. They do the Divine Reserve and they do the Bishop's Barrel. For my money, the Divine Reserve is always good, but for my money, the Bishop's Barrel is always the most interesting yes. because it's where they seem to like, really go in a different direction. Well, they take, they take a lot of their other things that they do and barrel age it. And, and it's just a wonderful— sometimes it's a special run. I don't know. Yeah, they do it's a lot a, of stuff. It's a wonderful experiment, and we will experiment with them coming up next. It's Smoking and Toasting, and we are so glad you're here. By the way, July is Craft Beer Month. We'll celebrate that with some hopefully amazing craft beer next. Welcome back. It's Smokin' and Toasting. I love that band, Pale. Uh, they, I just wish they were still making music. They were, a, yeah, it's a they, great band. They are really a great band. Welcome back. It's Smokin' and Toasting, and we are excited to be here, excited to be a part of your 4th of July weekend, because it's Thursday, so it's officially 4th of July weekend. So, um, Ian, you drop a drop of water into your, uh, your whiskey, this uh, single barrel from Rio Brazos that we tried in the last segment. And it was funny because you said this, and then I did it to mine and saw it happen. You could see the water working its way yes. into, just with a little drop, you could see it working its way into the whiskey. And Adam mentioned he put some water in his, and he said it became almost like maple syrup. So it definitely, like on the nose, I haven't tried it yet, but it definitely brings the maple syrup out. It's, it smells like if you took caramel maple syrup and, um, and uh, vanilla... And set it on fire with delicious like pecan mm -hmm. or, and oak. It just smells great. Mm. Wow. Okay. So I think I like it even better with with a drop or two of water in it. Wow. It tastes like candy now. It's it, right. It's not too sweet, but it's got this. There's a this brown creamy sugar and cinnamon brown sugar vibe going. That's just wonderful. There's a like cinnamon on the finish now. Mm-hmm. 
Mm. Vanilla way up front, brown sugar, cinnamon, a little caramel. Tons of wood. The wood still remains, but it's not as prominent as it was moments ago. And I'm going to drop. Yeah, I was thinking, I was thinking of a little more. Yeah. I'm going to drop a little more just to see what else happens. You know, I was. Uh, it reminds me when uh, you and I were both at this event. It was at B&B Butchers, actually. Um, it was a uh, uh, an event with Balvini. Balvini, yeah. And John Wingo. We got to taste uh, some of the Balvini 31 at this mm-hmm. event, which was spectacular, by the way. Um, but what was really interesting is when he encouraged everyone to go ahead and put some water in the 31-year-old single yes. malts. And some people, you could tell they were just reluctant to do it. And I remember, as amazing as it was, with a little bit of water added... It got better. It got better. It's really amazing. And this one, I think, also gets better with a little bit of water. What's, your, think, what's your feel? I like it. Um, I like it neat. But I got to tell you, I like... And I put two drops... Of, basically two drops of water in now, or two little tiny splashes of water. I like the one splash of water in this. But see, mm-hmm. this is part of the fun. It's still good this way. But it's a little more mineral and a little right. less of the candy flavor going on and all of a sudden. And the wood calms down a little bit. It's still there, yeah. but it calms down a little bit, and you get that sort of candy sweetness uh, a, a little more prominent. I would be really curious. I like the I like the one splash of water in this. I bet a small cube of ice would have been a wonderful ride. Well, I was just about to say, I, I, I know you talk about this a lot, that you like dropping the one cube in your whiskey, and you get the... Difference as the temperature changes. Yeah, because you'll get and you get the dilution, and and it's a, a great ride all the way through. Right, and then times. as it warms up, the ice melts, and you're holding it in your hand, and then you get the diluted flavor at the end. Uh, this is this is a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun with uh, neat. It was a lot of fun with a splash, and it's a lot of fun with two splashes in there. So much of what we like to talk about on this show is really awesome in a communal sav- uh, setting, and I know that we're not. You know, getting together and going out the way we did before the pandemic. But it sure is fun sharing these things with someone else, getting their input on on what it's about. To me, that's a big part of the whole cigars, craft beer, and spirits thing, is being able to talk about these things. And in a moment, we're going to talk about some Bishop's Barrel 25, which I'm very excited about. As you open that up, Ian, and provide us with some excellent sound effects. Nice. Uh, let me run down this list of the Rob Report's nine best cigars. If uh, if if money is no object, hang on, I gotta grab another. Here. Money is an object I have found recently, especially. <laughs> yes, it is a particularly <laughs> tough object to a partic- particularly tough object to uh, to get sometimes. Um, but uh, any but, of you out there that have too much of it, if you need a hand with it, send it my right, way. Right, Ian and I will take care of you. It's not a problem. <laughs> um, it, but the Robert Vort, think of these as, if money was no object, these are are the cigars that they would pick. By the way, I'm not saying they're the best expensive cigars because I've agreed with some of their uh, picks in the past and have disagreed with some of their picks in the past. Well, and but, some of them you can't have an opinion on because they're so expensive you'd never y- smoke You're never anyway. going to try them, yes. Um, they they designate nine cigars. They talk a lot about cigars made with really ultra-aged tobacco leaves. That's kind of their focus yeah. in some of this. So uh, at at in the first position... They describe this as the most collectible cigar, uh, and it's, it's the Cohiba Spectre 2019. They say Rolls-Royce may have its Phantom and its Ghost. Cohiba has the Spectre. If you like drama with your smoke, it's the cigar for you. From an acrylic case and unique tubes to the dark and oily cigar itself, uh, the Spectre 2019, which is a much more powerful follow-up to the 2018, is a conversation piece. It doesn't tell me in this article what the price is of this. I wish it did. It um, it says it's good with uh, a espresso, dark chocolate, and uh, or a glass of 1994 Fonseca Vintage Point, or a snifter of Macallan 18. That's their that's their recommendation. Uh, the aged whole cigar. They go with the My Father Cigars La Promesa. Now this is a great cigar. We've had this. I think both of us have reviewed that particular cigar yes. on on the show, and it is quite good. So I would, uh, yeah, I would go along with this. For aged wrapper, they recommend the Partagas Limited Reserve Decadas or Decadas, which means decade, uh, twenty nineteen. The the Spectre. Yeah. 
ninety dollars. Ninety dollars. Wow. Not for a box. For a cigar. For a cigar. Yeah, I, I, I gotta tell you, I won't be trying one soon. Ninety dollars per cigar. You know what that is? That's the cigar you buy if you're in Vegas. Remember when we used to go to Vegas? Yes. Uh, back in the Vegas? day before the before the uh, pandemic. I mean, no, I don't remember anything oh. from Vegas. What are you talking about? <laughs> uh, it's the cigar you buy when you're in Vegas and you like hit a huge win somewhere and you're feeling like like you're spending house money instead of your own. That's yeah. the only time in my mind you buy a ninety dollar cigar. <laughs> that's a that's an expensive cigar. Uh, uh, think about how many great. Eight to twelve dollar cigars you could buy, <laughs> you know, for the same money. The new Nicaraguan from a Cuban legend. They recommend the Romeo, and Jul- the Romeo and Julieta, eighteen seventy five Connecticut Nicaragua. Now I've tried a number of yeah. the Nicaraguan cigars. I have not tried the Connecticut. Eighteen seventy five is available. But I think 18- I uh, did. I talk about that. We talked about that, but it wasn't. The, we both have actually reviewed that, but yeah. uh, it wasn't the Connecticut. It was gotcha. the Maduro. I think that we did. For medium strength, they like the Placencia Alma del Fuego. Which is a badass great, cigar. Yeah. Great cigar. Uh, for That's made a little in, pricey. That one's $20. Yep, yep. For Made in the USA, The American by J.C. Newman. For full body, and I'm going to agree with him here, the H. Upman 175th anniversary. Mm. That's That may be the best cigar A.J. Fernandez has ever blended. It's fantastic. That's the one that Alan uh, has given us both one yes, of those. I got one of those, I think, for my birthday from. Yes. Uh, Adam, who's on the wheels of steel here on the show. For annual ambassador, they like the Hoya de Nicaragua Numero Uno. I don't think I've had the Numero Uno since Drew Estate took over Hoya de Nicaragua, but uh, I'm going to have to try that. Uh, for most powerful, uh, they list the Monte Cristo Espada Oscuro. That's I have had cigar. one of these, and it's, it, yeah. is, it is strong, and it's wonderful. And finally, they name the Humanitarian... Uh, they they give that award to Carlos Fuente Jr. Uh, he um, is, you know, he's one of the guys. I mean, he's they say he's worked throughout his life to transform negatives into positive uh, positives. And when uh, a hurricane destroyed his family's tobacco farms in 1998, he stood in the mud soaked fields and said, "We're going to rebuild bigger and better." And and he did. Yep. And uh, he's been through a lot of struggles, the warehouse fire, a number of things. But there was an 11-year-old boy from one of the villages near the cigar factory who was diagnosed with terminal cancer and given two months to live. And um, Carlos Fuente Jr. and his uh, father had the boy admitted to St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis. The boy not only survived, but today he's a 22-year-old volunteer who teaches music to children throughout their foundation. Which is really really cool. So he got the humanitarian award, which That's they awesome. kind of tacked onto the end of that article, which was great. All right. So while I've been talking Rob Report expensive cigars, Ian has been sampling Bishop's Barrel Twenty Five. I haven't even uh, I haven't even gone for the sniff yet. What do you think? It's delicious. What is this one, by the way? Uh, you know, it, I I did not look that up. I probably should. It tastes like a porter that's been uh, barrel aged. That is kind of what it tastes like. It's it's interesting because, you know, a coffee porter usually has that coffee up front. On this one, you don't get the coffee until the finish, and maybe even like a few seconds after the finish is when you get that sort of wonderful gritty coffee uh, and maybe a little cacao sort of vibe. It wow, I got to try this. Again. I'm looking up what it is here. Mm-hmm. Mm. Interestingly, more carbonated. BB than I would have expected, but it works. It totally works. Bishop's Barrel is a special series that St. Arnold puts out, I want to say, twice a year. And it's it's really just outstanding. We've extended an invitation, by the way, to the St. Arnold guys to come on the show, which is writing a great wrong. I can't believe that we live in a city with a brewery that awesome, you and I, Ian. Yeah. And uh, we've gone 191 shows. Ah. And we've tasted plenty of their beers, but never actually had them on so we'll be correcting that wrong very soon Which baltic one? porter and port barrels baltic porter in port barrels okay this explains a lot about what it's we're their tasting. divine reserve 17 recipe aged in tawny port barrels beer mm. is a dark highly high viscosity brew fermented with our uh, lager yeast the same used in summer pills and springbok 
With an extended period on the yeast, the result is beer with bold, dark chocolate flavors with an incredibly clean, crisp finish. Wow, it's really good. It's it's very different. Um, you were right. You nailed that it's a porter. It's it's definitely yeah. not a stout. It's a porter. And it's sweet. It's, it's sweet. It's got that it's, raisiny sweetness to it. It's really delicious. Or date kind of sweetness to it. You know, it, it really is the kind of beer you want to sip. You it's know, chewy. The, the parish that we had earlier, that's the kind of beer you want to drink. This is the kind of beer you want to just. It's got sip. a delicious uh, bitterness around it, like uh, mm-hmm. like like the creme brulee, where the caramel, the crust is kind of burnt. Yes, um, the chocolateiness is is rather huge on this. I even do get a little bit of raisininess, mm-hmm. which seems to be the concurrent That's theme, the theme today. Right, the show today is raisininess. There's definitely uh, raisininess. In if this. we both smoked a cigar that had raisin notes to it, I mean, how funny that is almost that? never happens. And we we both smoked that and talked about it. Oh, well, so uh, on, I thought it was a little show. nuts. After you know, a lot of times after I do my uh, review, I like to just see what other people do, and I use Half Wheel as as uh, one of my checks right. just a good, to see a good hey, place to go. Yeah, what did what did they say about it? And uh, and one of the things they said about that cigar was raisins. Uh, well, I thought that was okay. funny. I was like, okay, so it's not just me. Like, yeah, I'm not so nuts. We're, so we're on it. Yeah, absolutely. But this, yeah, this is dark, viscous, delicious, raisiny. I what is the? I didn't look at the ABV on mm. it. It's high. You can taste it because it's yeah. boozy. It's definitely boozy. Nine point two percent after barreling. You know, that's not really that much, to be honest. Uh, from what you might expect from something that tastes like this, that's double what. A lot of beers are well. True. True. I mean, so in, I I think when you hit the eight percent mark, you got a pretty big beer. Mm-hmm. Well, if it's under right. that, so you a know. double IPA is eight to nine. Yeah, and and so if you're dealing with like an imperial, it's usually not much more than nine, nine nine five nine seven. So yeah, I, I've got the, this is more carbonated. You mentioned this a minute ago how carbonated it was. I this was surprised. This is more carbonated than I would suspect, but it's it totally works though. It's really good. I I have a, a real issue though with this beer, and that is that my cup is um, let me surprisingly let me. Uh, I don't want not, you to get drangry. Not as full as it should be. Drangry. I don't want you. Is to get that a drangry. word? I hadn't heard that before. That's good. I just I may have created that. I like that's it. when that's when you don't have a drink in your hand, uh huh, and you get a little angry. And what happens is your hand starts closing. And when your hand's fully closed, it's a fist. Oh, so see, that's not what good. you do to prevent that from happening is you put a drink in your hand. It keeps you from getting drangry. And see, this is this. These are the important things you learn on this show, and it's often not until the final segment, which is I mention only to encourage people to always. Try to listen or view the whole show. So that's right. To keep yourself from making a fist, just put a beer in both hands. It totally it's works. It's hard to make a fist it when you're totally, holding a beer. Totally works. See? A- and it's making peace. And it's hard to hurry up at a time. when you're smoking a cigar. That's right. That's uh, that's one of your my favorite so, quotes of yours. So if you've got a beer in one hand and a cigar in the other, it's really hard Dude. And let to me make s- a fist. Let me just angry. say, this feels like it would be fantastic with a medium-bodied cigar. Yes. I'm this will it. probably stand up to a lot of. Uh, I'm for it. Just the sweetness and robustness and thickness of this Bishop's Bear will probably stand up to most full flavored cigars. This reminds me of why I enjoy doing this show so much. Oh yeah, you know uh, why it's uh, why it's just fun to be able to taste these things and share them with people. So if you are a person that likes darker beers, like supporters, this is something you really must try. It's going to be different from some of the ones you've tried. But different yeah. in, a, in a really wonderful and I awesome love way. porters. Um, I you know I'm you know me. I like big and dark beers. Um, I love porters, and uh, and what they did with this was absolutely beautiful. That that port cask just adds a sweet wonderfulness. There's also the very finish of this has that that dry barrel finish that you get from the oak flavors and things like mm-hmm. that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'm interested, actually, to see what happens to this whiskey. Afterwards. Oh, that would be a good thing to check out. Yes. And this is the whiskey after a couple of drops of water. I'm going back and forth now. Which is such a lovely thought. Man, that, that whiskey is just really good. They are so good together. Yeah, they really work well. Like, don't I don't they? know that one really interrupts the other in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. What's interesting is... You get a little more of the chocolatey and the caramely in the beer after the whiskey, mm-hmm. and you get a little bit less of the oak astringency in the 
whiskey after the beer. Which, in my mind, makes it just even that much more enjoyable. More betterer, sir. More betterer, sir. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, to close out the show today, I want to uh, recognize the 2020 Industry Award recipients from the Brewers Association. Brewers Association is a not, not-for-profit not trade association which is dedicated to small and independent American craft brewers. Uh, they recently announced the recipients of their 2020 awards. The Brewers Association Recognition Award went to Oscar Wong, who is the founder of Highland Brewing Company in Asheville, uh, North Carolina. They are credited with kicking off a craft beer renaissance that took Asheville, uh, North Carolina, or uh, it took Asheville uh, from a sleepy mountain town to the craft beer capital of the Southeast. He's widely recognized as the father of Asheville craft beer. They just celebrated last year 25 years of brewing craft beer, which is pretty darn cool. Yeah. Uh, they uh, This year they'll celebrate his 80th birthday, and they say it's his pioneering spirit which in, uh, continues to inspire the local brewing community nice. uh, to this day. Also recognized with the Russell Shaver, uh, the Russell Shearer Award for innovation in craft brewing was Brandon McGivney, who's the chief operations officer at Odell Brewing in Fort Collins, Colorado. Man, ninety shilling. Oh man, we've great tried beer. we've tried so many yes. uh, great uh, Odell beers. My my personal favorite of theirs, although. They came out with a limited time IPA, and and now I can't remember the name of it. It was a limited release, and it was so good. And I was bummed because I didn't know it was limited, so I I didn't stock up. It, the Tree Shaker is also very good. Is that the one? Oh, I think uh, you, Tree Shaker. You enjoyed you can still the drum get. roll APA. Well, I was just about to say yeah. their drum roll APA, which so is uh, available parallel. all the time. Wow, that's one of the best yeah, pale great, ales in the business. Great that Sierra Nevada, some of the best pale yeah. ales in the business. So uh, these guys have been uh, have just been pioneers. Uh, McGivney's responsible for developing their regular Odell IPA, the drum roll, which you mentioned, uh, the five barrel pale ale, and uh, rupture. In addition to helping other breweries with his wisdom, his work has allowed smaller breweries better access to high quality hops. Nice. They have a hop picker IPA, which is just mm-hmm. just absolutely wonderful. So they do great IPAs, but they do other things as well. Odell is, uh, yeah, well, thumbs their, up. their ninety shilling is is a that's another go to for me. Like, absolutely. The FX Matt Defense of the Industry Award goes to Adam DeBauer, who is the co-founder and director of operations at a brewery we were just talking about a couple of shows ago, Austin Beer Works yeah. in Austin, Texas. Uh, now, not only do they make um, l- amazing beers there, uh, but this award was named for the late FX Matt of FX Matt Brewing Company, and they presented it to Adam DeBauer from Austin Beer Works um, because of his contributions and efforts in championing the small brewing industry. In 2019, uh, along with a lot of other uh, Texas brewers and Craft Brewers Guild of Texas, they drove a successful effort to allow most manufacturing breweries to sell beer to go in their tap rooms. Now, the virus has put a real you know damper on this, but that was such a big deal. Yeah, it's huge, and and such a big thing for most of these smaller and independent breweries to be able to you know stay on their feet and support themselves because they could actually sell to go. Right from where uh, they Well, are. so there's a lot of places where it's normal, but the TABC here in Texas, that was not. And At the time. Can correct. you imagine? Yeah. Can you imagine if you're anywhere outside of Texas, imagine this scenario. Because it's nor- it was normal here for a long time. Imagine mm-hmm. the scenario. You walk in a brewery. They're not allowed to sell you beer. In a brewery. In a brewery. Yeah. That you're doing a tour on. Now, you can have samples. And even, right, even when you could actually buy a beer and drink it there, you couldn't say, wow, I like this. I want to take a growler of it home. Yeah. So I remember doing that. And this was before before the breweries were all open. I remember going to um, Martin House, I think. Martin House up in uh, In Dallas, Dallas, Fort Worth area. Mm -hmm. And we did a uh, we did the tour. We hung out there. We had a great time. We drank a bunch of beer, and I was like, "Man, I really like some of this beer." The breakfast, uh, three a.m. or whatever. And their specialty beers are yeah. Always and so I was good. like, well, "I would love to take some of this home." And they're like, "Well, we can't sell it to you, but there is a convenience store right over there, <laughs> literally a block away, that sells our beers." 
and that was their solution. But I mean, right. a lot of places aren't that conveniently located to a convenience but, store but that think, happens to stock right. every one of their beers. And think about that. With all due respect to the convenience store, which was doing a great thing, um, they're not making nearly as much money per beer, the right. guys at Martin House, as if they could sell it to you directly. Well, and the nice thing is since they did change that, and that's what is so important about that uh, that award you just read, is since they did change that, is now you can go in, you could buy a Crowler. A lot of play Crowlers are real popular. The Crowler is the big can. And if you think about it, the ability, the ability to do that during the pandemic is what has probably kept yeah. a lot of those breweries from folding. Yeah. You know, big it time. really is a big deal. By the way, speaking of Martin House, the Salty Lady Goza. It's yeah, one it's of the good. best gozes I've ever had. Oh, it's <laughs> so incredibly good. Well, wow, we have tasted some wonderful things. You know, every now and then we have a show, uh, Last show number 190 last week, where at least one of the beers was like, eh, the uh, the Montucky uh, snack. Yeah, I didn't know. Oh, cold not a snack. Fan, not a but fan boy, everything one. on today's show I think has just been exceptional. So I would say yes. Uh, I'm still kind of juries out on juries the Florida out for man. you on Florida man. I dig it, Florida man. I, I don't know. It's and that's Florida just a my that's just a my palate thing. You know, yep. that's I don't. I wouldn't take that as it's not a good beer. That's yeah. You're you're just not as just into not my the IPA palate. thing uh, uh, as I am. You hopheads. Yeah, we you know we we got that going for us. Uh, finally, before we go, we want to leave you with some drinking news. And since Ian has not yet, we've been doing plenty of drinking, so it's about time. Since Ian has not yet come up with our drinking news song, you will now be tortured by me singing, drinking news, drinking news, now it's time for drinking news. Surely you can come up with something better than that. Okay. I'll You're a musician. I'm not. I, I love hanging out with musicians. I love, you know, listening to music, watching bands play, but I am not a musician. Or a singer, as you can just uh, you know, as you, <laughs> as you may have just noted. Um, here's our drinking news for today. Remember, drinking news sometimes is stories about drinking. Sometimes it has nothing to do with drinking. It's just fun stories, but they're when fun, you are drinking. Fun stories for when you are enjoying a drink yourself. Uh, and today, uh, the story is about something that's been uh, a really big deal in the news lately, and that is that there are some statues around the country that have been taken down in light of the. George Floyd uh, protest, uh, there are some places that have said, you know, maybe this statue we have honoring someone who was a slave owner back in the day or someone who espoused some ideas that are not completely cool in a day when we're trying to be, you know, a little more aware of mm -hmm. uh, of what's right and wrong. Uh, so maybe, maybe some of these should come down. And so with that in mind, the officials in Kentucky decided to take down respectfully, a statue of Jefferson Davis. When they did, they discovered that apparently back when this statue was put up, somebody was drinking on the job. Workers there made a surprising discovery when they removed a statue of the Confederate president. Beneath it, an 84-year-old newspaper and a bottle of bourbon. <laughs> <laughs> beneath the statue. Now, I, I know Adam's posting a, a picture of this. I don't know if it's if it's up yet. Uh, you can see it, but there's an actual picture of the bottle of bourbon, and it's a Glenmore, a bottle of Glenmore bourbon, and there's a uh, there's a shot of the newspaper uh, next to it as well. But yeah, that's uh, that's how that's how it goes. Brilliant. <laughs> so uh, so I, I thought that was you know great for drinking news because. It shows that even back in the day, they, um, <clears throat> you know, they. I like that it's called Glenmore. Yeah, Glenmore. They're they're, they're obviously trying to. I, I don't know if I'm familiar with Glenmore, but obviously there are a lot of uh, of whiskeys from from Scotland. Right. Uh, there's a lot of Scotch that is Glen, the Glen something. Glen is Valley. Yeah, Glen is Valley, right? Right. So this is just more Valley. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. By the way, the uh, the Kentucky Historic Properties Advisory Commission voted to relocate this statue to the Davis State Historic Site, which is a state park in Fairview. So they weren't just tearing it down and destroying it. They were moving it from a more prominent site to one that was more about Well, uh, perspective the is important. So perspective is important. And uh, so is the perspective that whoever put the statue up back in the day apparently was enjoying a nice drink at some <laughs> point during the erection of the statue. So we'll leave you with drinking news. We'll leave you with a show that I think has uh, has talked about some really 
awesome and incredible things. And we'll leave you with Ian pouring himself just a little bit more of that uh, uh, special Bishop's Barrel 25 from St. Arnold. Had we, to have something to toast. We will have St. Arnold on the show soon. And by the way, coming up next week on the show, we will welcome a special guest, Samuel Fitch from Florida Kanye. Uh, who uh, our boy Hamilton, Super uh, who's been on the show with us uh, a number of times. Hamilton's so awesome. He's so man. awesome. So this is one of his big bosses. Coming in to talk rum and Florida Kanye. We'll see you next week for that. Until then, have a great week, my cheers, friends. Cheers, everybody. And cheers. Oh, so good. Oh, yeah. so good to you. Whatever happens, don't leave it so soon